So I asked uh, Ken for a bio, and he said, uh, at his age, less is more. So, uh, but, uh, but with that, uh, Ken is the uh, president of uh, Condor Consulting, and he's also a director for the DMEC and uh, WGCs, that's the Decennial Mineral Exploration Conference at the Women of Geoscientists in Canada. Okay. Secret chemical passwords thing on privy. Yeah, we have to be, you know, my age, look at what goes on the, the headstone, right? So it has to be fairly small. <laughs> so yeah, the, the theme is, is, is touched here. <clears throat> In the discussion we just had, it's, it often is, to me, there doesn't seem to be any lack of problems. People articulate them at all levels, from the highest levels in the industry to down in rooms like this. There is, what seems to be lacking often though is like, what do we do? I mean, it's sort of like, sometimes it seems like it's so overwhelming and so many fronts that say, well, do we really care what happens inside the mining industry because we're ex explorationists and we're special and we live in our own bubble. And well, let's create our environment and we'll not worry about what happens in a mine drive in, in WA because that's not really relevant to us. And it's interesting that statistic, you know, only 50 reported. I, I hear things that are coming out of Australia like the whole fly in, fly out is totally a cock up. I mean, they have like a 20% churn a year of people leaving. It's just, it's not working well. Clearly, and families are, I'm sure, stressed out because of that whether male or female. You know, it's just sort of like the industry is, is and I, I'm not sure if it's because it's run by largely a group of old white men that don't really care. They just want the money. But my last slide that I, I, I picked out from one of the web servers yesterday, they're saying the generation, generational change is now happening and they have to look for people of gender and age diversity and experience and soft skills that the current crop don't have. And I mean, I, the, I have this, this iconic one. In geophysics, I have a conic section, this the Olympic Dam one that everybody talks about, you know, the MT and the size of it. But and on, the, on the mining side, it's bloody Mount Polly. When that dam broke, the, the entire executive, Imperial, should have been flown to a remote island in the Pacific with no cell phone service. As soon as those guys started opening their mouths, they made a bad situation worse. And I thought, here you are in, in a first world country, and you have a problem like that happen, and it's just, they, they totally balls it out. I could not, if I had young children, I don't, they're both 40 and 41, I could not recommend them going into a business like ours. So, we have issues. But this is a story about something that we started off to do one thing and we actually saw that we touched on something much larger. I, th I encourage all of you that that is important, that taking that first step to do something, there are unexpected consequences that people will look and say, that's a good idea, we should try something like that too. So don't think because you're one person, because you're a Sarah or a Ken, it's just you. Everybody's looking for some message to try and help them. And when we started this exercise, I don't know, I usually ask, I know the old fart in the room probably knows him, Frank Arnott. Who, who knows Frank Arnott by name? That person. Maybe Dennis doesn't even know. Well, that's, that's fine. Because the people that knew him knew him extremely well, were, were good friends with him, and we were felt for his passion in what he was doing in geoscience. And he passed away in 2009, far too early, late 50s. And a group of us got together and said, how can we do something to honor his memory? What Frank's vision in the last decade, he was an educator, he was a geoscientist, he was, a, he was one of these guys, he was a Brit, and one of the most intractable problems that I ever saw him solve was he was in Denver in 2002. He was working away in his hotel, and the, and the fast food restaurants had started a process where 
They only would serve you after 11 if you were in a car. Frank didn't have a car. But the intractable Brit figured out a way to get a freaking hamburger out of those blighters. And I don't know if he came up and squatted like this and pretended and made sounds like a car, but he got fed, and that was Frank's innovation. So we thought, initially we were going to do a simple cash award to some students. It's a good idea. Other people were doing things like that. But we came around the idea of let's do something to honor his vision on data integration. And to do that, you actually have to have a process. And so we created a, 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 a open source, crowdsource contest. There's others around there. I mean, the iconic one for us often is the Gold Corp back in the late 90s. Uh, Gold Corp re revisited that. Integra has done one. All of these are commercially driven to solve a problem that's important to a company. And that is a good thing because people can make some money and get um, make a re reputation around this. Ours was really aimed at the idea, what could we show the industry could be done with data that hadn't been done before? If we got some bright people, experienced and, and student or recent graduates, looking at a bunch of interesting data sets, what could they come up with? There was no right answer. No right answer to this. It was like, we wanted to see what's inside your brains. What are you thinking? What can you tell us about ways that we haven't looked at this data before? And the guy who runs uh, Geoscience BC, the minerals part, he says, I don't care if the group that won the contest doesn't know as much about porphyry coppers as Dick Silito. He says, they told me things about that data none of these experts had ever told me before in ways of looking at it. Dennis captured that very effectively at 17. So that's what we were after. Um, it was interesting. He actually he wasn't, his health was deteriorating at that point in 07. He wasn't able to attend. But I sent him all the proceedings and he went through it all. And that was his comment that 3D was creeping into presentation. So right up to the end, Frank was uh, staring pretty hard at these problems. So because everybody talks about it, I mean, some, and I have enormous respect for my colleagues at Mira, think the answer is GoCAD. I don't think it's a box, it's a concept. And I think even John McGaughy will admit this, that the common earth model is not a thing, it's an idea. An idea that has to be in our heads, that we can share, we can collaborate with, and this is what we wanted to try and build. We were, even though one of our, two of our representatives or committee or from Geosoft, this was not a Geosoft exercise. This is not a way to promote that commercial product. People could use uh, plexiglass if they wanted to. Models. I've seen one here at the conference a couple of years ago. There was the group that's worked on it. Um, we worked eight years to get it to the over the finish line. And then, unfortunately, or fortunately, this is just a wrap up of what took place. We had these five data sets, two from Australia, uh, two from Canada, and the Kvitsa mine data, which was a very, very interesting and the only one that people didn't work on. It was a mine, a very detailed set of data. First one and provided us from uh, uh, their mine there, which now Belin owns. We got a top flight set of judges to work on this. Had some great sponsors. We basically organized enough cash to uh, give the kids something, or the people who participated, they weren't all young people, there were, but most of them, even the expert teams, were relatively young, certainly from an idea perspective, uh, to, and help pay their way to the conference, and uh, that was important for them. Expiration 17, which is where we presented the, the award. The awards were done in, uh, at 17, and what came out of that was that particularly from the students, they said, we would like to have one of these when we're going. We weren't ready when this happened in, in 16, 15 and 16. So we were pressed, I guess, the group to come up with an idea. We call it the Frank Renault 2.0. Uh, and uh, we had a meeting in March of last, uh, the last PDAC. And with that, we brought, because we saw it was important to broaden the scope. It wasn't an international contest. We had teams from, 
from Brazil, Canada, the UK, and Australia all participating, was to look at what was going on in Australia. And this is where the way the Frank or Not contest merges with what they call readiness. How many people in the room have heard that term? I, they, the Aussies come up with a lot of strange terms, but readiness is percolating around. This is the idea. What do young geoscientists have to have to be useful to industry when they're coming out of university? Or at the stage that they're looking for employment and will be hired by somebody? Are they ready for the job? The thing is, the academic part of it is just that. It's a slate. It's a, whole, it's, it's a syllabus that they actually work through in mathematics, and geophysics, and geology. It's all defined. And of course, if you know the professors, you probably even know it even more to a narrow extent, because that professor probably is extremely predictable in terms of what sort of information they pass on to their students. Problem is, that ship has sailed. The industry now has things that they are asking the students that don't look like anything being taught in the universities. And the companies know that. 20 years ago, the company I worked for, BHP, we would take 30 graduates from around the world and we would hold them captive for a month and train them in the beginnings of what it meant to be a BHP employee, what safety was. We didn't do gender at that time, but the women were reasonably well represented, but certainly back in the mid-90s. They don't do that anymore. Companies can't afford to do it. They have to hire people who have experience. And so there's a gap developing between what is the formal education is and what companies really want, saying this is these are the important things going forward. So we brought together the Frank Arnott 2.0 concept. Can we get this program embedded for access to universities around the world? And can we look at this issue? Because we should, because it's probably part of a larger one of this readiness. So it's interesting, the Australians are probably far better at communicating geoscience issues collectively for some reason than in Canada. I'm not saying we're autistic, but we don't seem to have forums where the leaders get together and talk about things other than their frickin' financial reports. Or if they do, they do it at a very high level, and it's like, what do you actually get out of this if you have a forum at the Roundup or the PDAC? It looks good. You see all the suits up on stage. There's very little actual, this is what we do afterwards sort of thing. The Australians aren't particularly fast at this, but they've been working on these ideas for, for almost a decade as to how to transform, because it has to be driven by the business, how do we transform the exploration industry to be more successful looking undercover? That's what it's about. What sort of people do we need? How do we train them? How do we identify them? How do we recruit them? How do we encourage them? So, whereas in Canada, what I find is we're actually better at just going out and doing something. We don't necessarily spend a huge, like the CMIC Footprints Program, some of you are aware of this. As far as I know, there's three guys in the room, basically, got together and decided this is what we're going to do, like 10 years ago. I know the three guys. They're smart. But why three guys in the room decided this and then sold it to everybody else? In Australia, they'd have 300 people in a room go through a much broader consensus building. It's frustrating sometimes because democracy we know is messy. And it, may take, it takes them a long time. But at least, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people who can contribute who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity. And I think that makes for some of the problems that programs like the Footprints had. <clears throat> it met the needs of certain parties, but it didn't meet the needs of the industry as a whole. That's my impression. And I was a director for a while. So we were looking at an interesting meld that wasn't the plan. But the guy I invited over from Australia, Robbie Rowe, was the uh, basically worked with the Myra to develop a number of the roadmap results. And he, being aware of the Frank or not, put questions out to the Australian industry about a collaborative program for students like the Frank or not. 
they had a lot of uh, uptake. They thought it was a good idea. Um, but of course, there was a broad diversity of what are the other things we would add to a, to a, uh, a curriculum for students. So over in Oz, they're at a stage now where they've actually got some specific programs they're looking at implementing. The Frank are not, they're semi-relying on the center of mass over here in, in Canada to basically allow the program to go forward, but they would, I think if we were not able to do that, and I think we are going to be, have something going, I can tell you about in the next, uh, in the next year and a half, they would probably build something like this over in Australia. And that would be fine, but it would be more isolated around maybe an Australasian type of program. So, the roadmap capacity, looking at brownfields, greenfields, transitions. Um, I'll, I can make this material available to people. I'm, I can't really, there's too much to try and absorb at a time like this. But they get down to sort of the granularity of uh, things like new training, future skills, gender balance, increased diversity, boundary spanning. How many have heard boundary spanning? That's another good Aussie term. Ah, right, you've been to the right meetings. Concept is we need people out there that basically can move across disciplines between geology, geophysics, geochemistry. What became pretty obvious in the Frank Arnott discussion in March was the mining industry needs this at a whole bunch of different levels. It's not just exploration. There's, there's a change afoot in the way we acquire, we process, and use data. And it's not just a, a buzzword about AI. There's a whole bunch of things happening that we are not really accommodating in our education system, and we probably can't. Because those professors, God bless them, they're not going to be changing an order of magnitude in any time soon. It has to be somewhere else, somewhere between the practical side of the industry where you're at the coal face and coming out of academia. And this is one of the things the Australians are kind of looking at. My thought was of listening to the discussion in, in March was that maybe you do, you know, BCIT in British Columbia, the, the British Columbia Institute of Technology. So almost some of these skills, these are tradecraft. This isn't professional knowledge, this is tradecraft talk about issues like gender balance. If you're actually going to be educated in that, where is the forum if you're not working for a company? How does an individual consultant get exposure to that so they actually learn something and get some professional accreditation? It's not obvious yet because those discussions really haven't taken place as far as I can see. Um, Robbie put, presented this so he's got a little bit of the history of this, this event. Uh, it wasn't just me, it was the Frank Renaud Committee that got the thing kicked off. Uh, I've seen the incoming guy, who's the, he is a guy, president of the PDAC. It's very interesting that he, he's, he's written a couple of really poignant paragraphs about what he sees geologists as not having the skill sets to do. And you know what's missing from that list? This is, this is young people going forward. It's not a word about geophysics. And I'm thinking, how could, a, how could a person looking at the future of exploration ignore that entire discipline? And he said, oh, well, of course, they'll just pick up a book. Or, you know, there's that great one by Dentith and Mudgy on geophysics. And it's like, no, it just does, it's not going to happen by, ha uh, by accident. It's going to have to be conscious design. So questions that he sent out, it's pretty interesting because as, as mentioned a couple of times earlier, we need data. Without data, you can't make good decisions. So we need information about what people actually, what the current situation is, what people actually think. Then we think about plans and make suggestions and see if we can build consensus around that. So a lot of effort to try and put the right questions because so much of our time is spent, I think, often with the wrong questions, and they fritter away valuable time. You have to figure out what the critical questions are to begin with, or as soon as you can, and put them to people. FAA stands for the Frank Renaud Award, timeframes, inspire, increase, I mean, the, some of the things that Sarah talked about, uh, and even more so is getting, because right now if you have students, they're often, in, to me, the vision is of a good student, they're in their cubicle doing their work. Something like the Frank Renaud brings a diverse group of people together, 
hopefully of a, of a, with a reasonable gender population, and they're actually working to solve a common problem. It's not totally foreign to universities, but it doesn't happen very often. One of the things, that's what the workplace is becoming more like. So we're trying to replicate what, in the university environment, the Frank or not, the workspace that, that young people will actually go into when they get employment. They'll already be prepared for teams. The oil industry, God bless them, already largely worked like this. Three years ago, I went to a workshop put on by the AGU and the SEG. There were 40 delegates. Two of us were from outside oil. Every oil person introduced themselves. Every person introduced themselves as a member of a team. I never did that in BHP. I never had that concept in my mind. They just work that way because they know they need the log engineer. They need the, the uh, fracking guy. They need the geophysicist and the geologist all working on the problem. In part, it's because of the amount of money they spent. There's a program the oil industry runs, we found out, actually before the Frank Arnott 1.0 went to judging, that's uh, been run for a number of decades called the Imperial Barrel Award. Very similar concept. They're drawing from student groups around the world. I think there's well over a thousand students have participated. It's run by the AAPG. At our meeting in March, we actually had the person who runs that program uh, up for the day. She's an employee of Chevron, but she's, she also has this volunteer job. They've made her available. And one of the things that she indicated the oil industry's using this Imperial Barrel Award is rather than having to bring students in for placements on a temporary basis <coughs> for summer employment, is they use this as a metric to see if the right sort of talent is available up on the stage to basically offer employment to them. And so the industry actually does the judging. The sponsors are there in the audience, and every year at the APG, they have the finalists. There's a, a series of lead-in competitions around the world. And uh, they often, those companies often provide the data sets as well. So, and Sarah touched on this, any of these solutions to these problems we're facing have to make economic sense. You can't just do it based on what you think is the right thing to do morally. There has to be, this makes sense for the industry going forward. Because otherwise, if you don't have money, you don't have employees. You don't create a, a wealth of jobs. This is some of the feedback that Robbie got, pretty significant. It's important to uh, assess all of these, but to say it's still, I guess his summary comment was that everybody agrees there's an issue, but the actual going forward program is still difficult to see who's standing up and making choices. So that's where we're often, uh, uh, that's where we're often facing. This was yesterday, sort of I thought this was kind of timely. And I'll read it because I think it's important. The boards are also pushing for candidates with gender and age diversity. Subtle pushback against an industry led by older men with extensive experience in running mines. I would actually disagree with that point. I think that the, the operational people have largely been stripped out and that's why a lot of companies aren't doing particularly well. It's because they have people that really don't understand <coughs> that what sounds like a dumb process, which is digging dirt out of the ground or rock, they're not very good at it. Um, this is the uh, accountants and others, although some like Glassenberg are quite good. So the change is coming. Focus on, focus on this second paragraph. It's going to be less about the actual process of being a miner and more about how you maintain, develop and maintain your social license. Because if you blow that, you don't have a story. You're not doing very well. And I think more women in the mix is going to be better for the industry, and it's certainly going to be better for the overall teams that are working on these problems. So the PDAC has indicated they will support a Frank or Not 2.0. Our first award will be done at the 2020 PDAC. We need about a year run in. So we're beginning the process. There'll be a press release on that coming out once our website's up. So we had approached the Society of Economic Geologists and the PDAC because we weren't sure who 
would really stand up and, and support this. The SEG, uh, the geological SEG likes the idea, but they're going through their own strategic reorganization right now, and so they just couldn't take on another change in this particular time, whereas the PDAC sees this as extremely relevant for a number of their initiatives supporting young people, gender diversity, and having things that, that put the PDAC front and center as not just a trade organization, which they've been known as historically, but a, a player in the geoscience space, which is important, because they do have a lot of resources. So, it's changing. Got more of the people on the center and the left. We're still, we're not going to throw, toss them off the train anytime soon, but I think the mix will be good for everybody. Thank you. So the 2020 is going to be run like the, the last one. The same sort of we're idea. going to focus on the students. We're not going to do the expert. So we'll be <coughs> university uh, driven. But the same idea: get a, get a project there with a lot of data, and let the students go to town on it. We're canvassing for some new data sets right now. Right. Uh, we'd like to get something of a more regional nature out of Europe, uh, because the Europeans uh, want to be a player. It's just getting them engaged. Yeah. Uh, the Australians are just an endless supply of awesome data. Uh, That's good. That's great. Uh, frankly, I was uh, blown away by the quality of the presentations at, at 17. Just phenomenal. Really phenomenal. Including one here from U of S. And it was, it was great. And, and even better was the awards night. It reminded me of a, uh, a Golden Globes Award type of thing. You know, you have tables sitting around, and the winners are, and everybody jumps up and screams, and, you know. And the big, you like the big checks? Those are good. Great. Yeah, the big checks, all the whole deal. It was really good. So I'm glad to see it's going to happen again, including the award banquet. There'll be some sort of award banquet, will there? Uh, the, yes, the, um, how does the PDAC want to do this? The, the presentations will be on the Sunday, and then the awards will be Tuesday. There's a student event Tuesday noon, or you know, like noon to two o'clock or something. So it'll be broken up. Okay. And the, and the, and the, but the judging will be actually at the session on Sunday. Well, yeah. After the presentation. Yeah. Whereas we did a for the original <coughs> Frank or not one, we had the, the judging was done a couple months prior to, so we could notify the students and arrange travel and all the rest of that stuff. So a little bit different in the logistics. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, question? Yeah. Um, I guess just like perspective from TVUS, like one of the things that was, what I found very interesting was having the professionals there. Um, even though they're it, like, particularly young developing professionals, because one of the things that was nice was when we were doing our project, it was nice to like be creative, not like take too much influence, and you get that creative idea. But then at the same time, it's like looking at someone that's like just a few years up ahead and be like, "This is that potential. This is where it is." Not saying like, but you can see that compare and contrast. So like for someone that's just started, that's something really cool to see. Uh, maybe seeing programs that you've never seen before or something of that sort. Well, this is where the role. That it works some in the Frank or not 1.0, and we definitely be cultivating more of it since it focuses on students as the mentors. Yeah. Because we've actually had a lot of discussion about who we let through the gate in terms of formally participating, mm -hmm. but the mentors were. Uh, I mean, it was it was pretty amazing. This lady from the Imperial Barrel. This contest for them is so competitive. Some of these teams were hiring consultants, Whoa. so they could. I think you better yeah. make a rule against that. So it's like, whoa, <laughs> nobody in minerals would do that, would they? You know, anyways, but the mentors are, are, are a, fair, a fair game. That they, yeah, they to get a senior person. Uh, and one of the things I uh, was a lady, she was working, she was head of innovation for Barrick. Uh, Michelle Ash, she's actually moved, uh, Barrick's moved on or she's moved. Anyways, her son lives in, she's in Toronto, she's Australian. Her son lives in Sydney, and she was describing how, 16 years old, so he's going to school in Sydney, that he has three computer screens. And one is homework, one is his mates, and one is reserved for family. And she says, 
you have to make this interactive. And you know, you draw teams that aren't necessarily physically in the same locale. Is that would be to me, if we had a team, we're not going to put any rules in place that don't allow it, but whether you know, people will actually, the most, I think that I know of, the winning team actually was, was a person from Carleton who had worked at the GSC, and she couldn't get a team at Carleton, and so she approached some former colleagues at the GSC to participate, and so they ended up being the only one where, where people were in different, they were both in Ottawa, but not in the same institution. So we had a little bit of experimentation in that regard, but to me that would be, because a lot of what we're talking about in terms of keeping people's sanity and families together and the rest of it, you have to try and break down these physical barriers about everybody having to be in the same room for anything useful to happen. We have to somehow make that work, for sure. And then the other thing is, uh, amazing on the multiple disciplines, like, again, perspective. Like, I don't think I got to talk to you about this, but it was like, for me, I think, oh, well, I'm just mineral explorationist, that's it, you know, collaborating with the geochemists, collaborating with the geophysicists, and forcefully, like, not just saying, okay, well, I trust them. That's their department, they mess it up, that's their own fault. No, it was, you know, I had to learn and vice versa, and I really enjoyed that. That was actually my favorite part, I was the geophysicist on this team, but yeah, the, the interactive, interaction between each of the groups. Yeah. Uh, we were always testing each other's ideas. And I think uh, what you were saying with the, the, the professional category, I think one thing we could uh, offset that is if there's uh, even more emphasis on mentorship from uh, the companies. Because I know Tim Dobush and uh, Garnet Wood from Chemical, and Kyle's helped me over the years. A lot of things like uh, Garnet and Tim, they were able to help me with just a couple of emails uh, to get me started working on the data sets and thinking in the right ways, giving me papers to look at. Uh, and that, that helped my the learning process so much uh, from the geophysics side. And then of course, engaging with the other students. And of course, if they have their own mentors and their own disciplines, then they're bringing that information to me. So it's, uh, that's, that would be a, a real thing. That as long as you don't pay them to do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pay anybody. <laughs> I was shocked. I find that students are really keen to talk to industry professionals, and they would love to get more access to that. Sometimes it's hard to find the right person. But I mean, Dennis, you know this. I'm talking to someone who just recently finished undergrad, and he had emailed me because he was interested in my. Well, he saw where I went to school and where I did research and stuff, and and then you know he got to talk to four people at Tech last week, and they you know spent an hour with him each, and he's like, that was amazing. Brandon did, and three yeah. other people. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, they they really like that. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I think the, the Frank or not has, the, the time has come and I think, um, I mean, just the number of students came up to me who weren't involved that wanted to see something like this. You just had to listen because it was, it, we had no, I mean, we were really ready to hang up our spurs after this because we had worked on this a lot. I mean, I, I, I must have had, we did conference calls really, really religiously. And that's the thing, if you volunteer anything, it's good to volunteer, but make sure that vol other volunteers are actually up to it, because these things can be quite taxing. And the uh, thing is, you're, you're, on, you're, on, you're all up on the top of a ladder, and you know you need everybody, it's like rope climbing or mountain climbing, you need make sure everybody's anchored in properly. But uh, yeah, we must have had six or 700 phone calls over that period of time. Just amazing, because they're all an hour long or more. Really interesting investment, and you say, but it was so simple. Why did it take so much time? Because we really hadn't. You're sort of creating something from from ground zero, because there really wasn't anything quite like that. The commercial ones were interesting, and I have you know hats off to them. But they, I mean, I know Integra used that HeroX. They still send me like spam emails, but so they you know gave a pile of money to this group to manage it for them. So they didn't have any staff time whatsoever once they came up with the idea. It was easy peasy. Whereas we did it all ourselves. I mean, even, you know, Tim put a little bit of GSOF time in. I put some of the Condor people's time in. And, uh, and yeah, anyway, so it was good. So, as I say, if you've got a good idea, you think you've got some time to spend on it, have a go. Have a thrash. And just see what happens. Because people are surprisingly receptive. They're, everybody's aware of these things, but having people actually doing stuff is, is really kind of cool. And one of the things that 
the slide above <clears throat> that Bill's, I just wanted to mention about, back into Sarah's talk, the lack of, of women in senior levels in, in the industry. Because remember, she threw out the 50-50 stats sort of come out of school, but in the geoscience meetings, we look at maybe 20. And, but you go out to the senior levels, and that's dropped down really thin. And so they may be trolling for, for senior executive women to fill a lot of spots, but there's not a lot of people in that category. And so that's one of the things. Not to encourage like people like Sarah or other young women in the room to bail out and start you know, going back for an MBA or accounting degree, but the industry definitely needs people with those capabilities. Uh, a good job, just science background, but some of the other disciplines that are necessary to manage large, complex organizations. So, opportunities. Okay, off for a two and by. Or yeah, well that's it. We close it now. <laughs> yeah, thanks again.